All right. Okay, so let's get started. Um, exam one is graded. Uh, I've posted a video on Teams that goes through the exam breakdown, the statistics and whatnot. I kind of think that's, you know, you know, generally the, the more appropriate way to go. The class didn't ask if I would post my uh, post exam statistics to YouTube or anything, so I was like, I'll discuss all that stuff on Teams and whatnot. But in the end, I think the class did very well. I was very pleased. Um, I do genuinely think that exam two is easier. That doesn't mean don't prepare for it and don't study for it, but I think exam two is among the, the easier of the three uh, exams uh, in this course because um, it's just on bolts and welds. And so that's welding is going to be our topic of discussion today. If you remember when we first started talking about um, uh, uh, bolts, I had an introductory bolt lecture, and I said I'm not going to give you homework on this lecture. I'm going to do the same thing with welds. Today, we're just going to talk about welds. Okay? I'm going to talk about all of the relevant um, procedures, the relevant specs, the relevant, you know, what have you. Uh, and then what we'll do is we'll get into um, weld, welded connection analysis on, uh, on Wednesday. And on Friday, we'll get into welded connection design. I'll give you a homework Wednesday due Friday, a homework Friday due Monday. Monday we review for the celebration, Wednesday we celebrate, Friday no class. That's the Friday before spring break. The Friday before spring break. Unless you all really, really want to have class. In all seriousness, uh, we were able to catch up and whatnot with weather and whatnot, so I, I, I think we're fine. Um, what? This seems to be a crusade of yours, <laughs> Mr. Morris. Um, what's that? They're good ideas. I mean, that they're, they're good ideas for you. <laughs> you can vote all you want. <laughs> you can vote all you want. Okay, everybody good on the logistics and whatnot? Okay, any questions about bolted connections? Now, one thing that I did say on the team's recording, I always like to do suggestions for future exams. One of the things I suggested is that you make usage of the exam review sessions. Um, if there's anything on the homework assignments or any problems you want me to go through, any calculations you want me to do, like it would be a good time to do it. Um, so. Uh, as Monday approaches, if there's anything that we did either last week or this week that's a little fuzzy, let me know and we can we can review it. Okay, let's talk about welds. Okay, so um, what I want to do for today is I want to introduce you to some of the methods for welding, some of the terminology, the types of welds what welds we need to focus on as structural engineers, how we go about computing the capacity, how we go about designing, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, and I would argue that the when, it, when you get right down to it, the, no pun intended, but the nuts and bolts, uh, if you will, of uh, the, the capacity calcs, they are among the easiest that you could be. I, I tend to find that once you get the forces on a given connection, once you get the, uh, the, the loads and whatnot, that the actual connection design process is pretty rote. I mean, uh, you know, if I were to teach a whole course on advanced structural analysis, that would be sort of a big topic of discussion is just figuring out forces in structures and figuring out forces on connection regions and so on and so forth, because that's a, that's a topic in and of itself. But um, for the purposes of, um, uh, for the purposes of this, once you get those forces, the, 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 the connection analysis and design is pretty straightforward. But let's talk a little bit about welding. I'm curious, has anybody in here ever welded before ever? Okay, cool. We've got, we've got quite a few that's done that. Um, one of the things I'll tell you about welding is, I, I've welded myself, um, installing bolts is relatively easy. Everybody in this room could be trained to do that in a matter of an hour or two, you know. Barring OSHA and safety training and all that jazz. But welding is an art. That's hard to get it done correctly, to get it done well. Um, it, it's hard. Um, there's a reason why welders get paid a decent salary. 
I mean, bless you. If you want to make a lot of money, go be a, a nuclear submarine welder. <laughs> you'll make some cash, let me tell you. you you'll, you'll do just fine. Um, so, you know, I, I think that's worth mentioning. Welds are expensive. They, they are more expensive, I think, compared to their bolted connection counterparts. But there are reasons that you need them. There are reasons why they're necessary. Uh, for example, a common uh, connection in a building is when you're connecting columns to beams. And a lot of times what will happen is a fabricator will take the column and they will weld the connection plate onto the column. And then the beam already has the holes drilled. So all you have to do is bolt the beam to the connection plate. But it requires welding. You know, It requires surface prep. It requires the weld placement, requires weld inspection, uh, et cetera. So uh, what I want to do is I want to talk about the types of welds, the you know, methods for welding, and so on and so forth. I'm going to introduce you to some terminology that you may have heard, may not have heard, uh, and get right into it. OK. So let's talk about welding methods. And you may or may not have ever heard these terms before. Um, how many of you have ever heard of shielded metal arc welding? Probably not many of you. How many of you have heard of stick welding? Ah, there you go. There you go, right? So you may not have heard of gas metal arc welding, but you probably, another term for gas metal arc welding is metal inert gas welding or MIG welding. You've probably heard of that. So these are just different uh, terminologies. There are some, I, I guarantee you that there are some methods that you've never seen before, probably like submerged arc welding. You never, pro I guarantee you nobody in here, is, unless you are a welder by trade, has never done or seen uh, submerged arc welding. Yet submerged arc welding is very common in structural applications when you do long uh, continuous welds, like flanges to webs for, tub or for, for, for plate girders and, and whatnot, or for box girders. Um, so let's look at the welded, the welding methods, advantages and disadvantages, and so on and so forth. So let's talk about shielded metal arc welding. That's also no, commonly known uh, as stick welding. Um, maybe I should also take a little bit of a step back and make sure that everybody understands what we mean in general by the concept of welding. Okay, welding is not the process of taking piece of metal A and piece of metal B and gluing them together. It's not what you're doing, okay? What you're actually doing is you're melting three components of steel together. So if you're welding plate A to plate B, you're creating a molten region of plate A and plate B along with some consumable weld electrode. In this case, a weld stick or a weld rod. We call them weld electrodes in the you know, business of weld science, uh, if you will. Now, the way that it works, and I'll bring in some weld electrodes on Wednesday, but if you've ever seen a weld electrode, it looks like a thin rod of metal, and it's coated by this granular flux. It kind of looks like, I don't know, like crusted up cake icing or whatnot. It's kind of what it looks like. Um, the idea is that, first off, you know, whenever you look at a weld setup, what you've got is you've got one end of your circuit uh, hooked on to the weld piece and the other end hooked on to the electrode. So whenever you touch the electrode to the piece of steel, you are completing the circuit, electricity flows, and you begin to consume that electrode. Okay? What happens when you place that electrode at the joint where you're uh, applying weld is electricity is flowing and you are melting not only the weld consumable, but the two plates in question. Okay? Now, what does that granular flux do that's, um, that's uh, forming a coating on the, uh, the electrode? Well, as you <coughs> deposit weld and as the circuit is completed, that granular flux starts to dissipate. And it starts to, perform, or it starts to form a protective gas shield around the region where the um, where the weld is being placed. Basically, what it's trying to do is it's trying to, I guess the best way of saying it is correct the atmosphere around the weld so that there's no impurities inside the weld. If there's any one element that we are really concerned about inside of a weld, it is hydrogen, okay? We do not want hydrogen inside of a weld because what that does is it creates a brittle weld, okay? We don't like brittle welds. Okay. 
welds brittle, it's subjected to cracking, it will fail, and when it fails, it fails quick. We don't like hydrogen embrittlement inside welds. And so that gaseous shield generated by the uh, filler or the coating on our uh, weld electrode is what purifies that, uh, that atmosphere and gets rid of that uh, ambient uh, uh, oxygen, if you will. Does that make sense? Okay, so this is shielded metal arc welding. This is also called uh, stick welding, but in the spec, this is what it's going to be referred to. They don't call it stick welding in the in the spec. And so you, like, in all seriousness, like, I get what you're saying, that you might commonly call this a stick weld or a rod weld, but that's not what it's going to be referred to in here, okay? So you need to understand the, the appropriate terminology so that if you're going through the design process, you know what, what things are being referred to, okay? Make sense? All right. Gas metal arc welding or MIG welding. I mean, I'm curious. Um, this, I, I asked this question. It doesn't have anything to do with, with our science, but I'm just curious. Um, how many of you have weld, who have welded have welded using both stick and MIG weld? I'm just curious. I'm just curious which you think is easier. MIG. Yeah. See, okay, I think that's the case as well. Yet, I, I, this is this is shocking because I have asked this question just about every single time we've had in-person steel design. Everybody says stick welding is easier. No, I, that's what I said, you know. See, so for me, when whenever you're depositing using a MIG welder, you have to do this. But with a stick, you have to do this and that. You have to control not just your horizontal velocity, but your downward velocity as well. I think that's harder, but. Yeah, it, it sticks and what. Yeah. Now, if I'm being honest, what ends up getting used the most in structural applications is stick welding. Why do you think that's the case? I'm just curious for those of you that have done a little bit of welding. You get deeper, and by stronger, what does stronger mean? It means you get deeper weld penetration, that the molten area penetrates deeper into the weld part than you get with, uh, say, MIG welding. Okay. Now, that's not to say MIG welding isn't done. Of course it's done. Uh, it's done in certain applications. It's definitely done for tack welding. Uh, for certain connection plates and whatnot, yeah, maybe stiffening elements, yeah, you'll see MIG welding done. Um, but but it's but for really heavy uh, uh, load carrying connections, stick welding still tends to be the uh, the common way of doing things. Now, what is MIG welding? So the setup is completely different. Okay, whenever you're using a, a stick welding process, the basically what you have in your hand kind of looks like a jumper cable for a car and you clip your uh, weld electrode on and mm, you go to work, okay? But for MIG welding, the setup is very different. Inside your weld machine, there's this spool of wire, okay? Kind of looks like copper wire, but it's not quite the same color. You know, it's kind of a little different. And your box not only has um, a, uh, a, a, a continuous spool of wire, but there's also a tank, a gas shield, right? So like, for example, when we run out of our gas shield, we'll take it down to air gas and whatnot and say we need it refilled, right? Okay, and so whenever you click that trigger, you are not just uh, spooling out your uh, electrode, you are spooling out that gas as well. So it's sort of the same idea. When you have plate A connected to plate B, you deposit your weld, weld uh, uh, the circuit is complete, electricity begins to flow, your weld electrode begins to be consumed, but that gaseous shield begins to uh, uh, be deposited, and that's what purifies the air as well. So it's, it's done in the same way. You're getting the same uh, effect. With the stick weld, it's the granular flux that coats the electrode that generates your gas shield, whereas with a, uh, a MIG welder, there's actually a tank that's, uh, that's depositing uh, that gas shield uh, as well. Same purpose, though. We want that gas shield to remove impurities from the atmosphere because what we're trying to eliminate, for the most part, is, is that hydrogen. Now, um, there is a similar um, MIG welding process uh, that uses what's called flux cord uh, wire. Has anybody ever used that? You probably use that. So whenever you, how can you tell 
when a weld has been deposited using flux cord? What's the part look like? It's got this white grainy gunk on it, right? Because the, wi the, the wire itself, so whenever you're using flux cord, it's much like a MIG welding process, only there's no tank. The wire itself has this uh, protective flux that generates the, the gaseous shield. You can always tell when, when welds are deposited like that because whenever you deposit using you know, just a regular old stick weld or MIG weld, you just get steel, right? But whenever you deposit using like a flux core, you get this white sooty granular stuff that you kind of have to chip away. It looks just like this white grainy stuff on, on top. Y yes? Is this TIG welding? No, 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 no. That, that's a great question. TIG welding, so let's talk a little bit about TIG welding. TIG welding is an entirely other process altogether. You will pretty much never see TIG welding done in structural engineering applications. TIG welding is used for much more precise and fine welding. If I'm being honest, we just don't do that a lot in large structural applications. You will see TIG welding done in machine design and mechanical engineering quite a bit, but n not in a building. You know, that's that's your finesse artwork stuff. You know, like not 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 for us. Can anybody TIG weld? I'm just curious. I I've never attempted that. No, I, I I know my limits, and, and I have seen TIG welding done, and it's just, it's, um, it looks beautiful in the end, and I'm like, I know why you make what you make. <laughs> I, I can't do it. You'll see it in pipes, and, and whenever you're, you're well, like pipe to pipe, because you can get that geometry a lot better. So again, it's like fine, like, like low tolerance work, I guess. It also, yeah, it, it does take longer to deposit TIG welds. You know, that's another thing. Now, one benefit, though, of flux cord, and, and I want to be clear about this, this benefit, is flux cord welding, because there's no gaseous shield, you don't need a gas, okay? And so when would that be a benefit? It would be a benefit if you were welding outside, okay? So... A lot of times in uh, structural engineering applications, a, a lot of times, sometimes we don't do all of our welding in the shop. Sometimes we do it in the field. However, and I want to be crystal clear about this, it is not recommended in most cases to do welding in the field. Just isn't. Um, you tend to not get the QAQC, the quality control in the field that you would in the shop. And to be frank, it's usually just more expensive. Sometimes stuff happens, you fabricate something in the shop, you get out to the field, oh, damn, they put that plate in the wrong spot. And so somebody's going to have to grind it off and weld it somewhere new. And that's going to have to be done in the field. This is a good product, but that's expensive. So we try and avoid it, okay? Uh, so this is a good product for that uh, 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 type of environment. Now the fourth um, is what's called submerged arc welding. This is the type of stuff in structural engineering land that you would see done by a robot, okay? Um, the, what happens with submerged arc welding is the welding is just that, it is submerged. What happens is, is you have this um, robot that is basically depositing two things. So the first thing it's depositing is the weld, but it's also depositing this granular flux. It kind of looks like kitty litter, you know? And what happens is the weld is done under that granular flux. So there's a, a, a good amount of quality control in terms of heat input and, and speed and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, the, if you're going to set this up to, to be performed, there needs to be a reason for it. Uh, and so this is usually very good for long, flat, horizontal welds. So we're talking about things like welding the flange to the web for a plate girder. You know, we're talking about a web that might be, or a, a weld that might be, you know, 60, 80 feet long, you know. And so you could just set a robot up to do that for you. You're not going to do that for a, um, a connection plate on a column that's only six inches long. You're probably just going to clip that on and, and a human being is going to do it, okay. Um, but for long, continuous welds, a, uh, uh, a saw process might, might make more sense. Um, any questions about welding procedures? Does this all make sense? Okay. Now let's talk about the types of welds. Okay. Now I, this isn't everything. 
I'll, I'll be honest, this isn't everything, but this is about everything that you are going to see in a real world structural engineering application. And there's one that I really want to make sure everybody understands, and that's the fillet weld. Okay, so first off, let's talk about these, these welds. So a tack weld, okay. Now, it is true, just about every welding operation that you've ever seen performed is going to utilize a tack weld. What's a tack weld for, okay? Is it structural? Is it meant to hold up uh, load, you know, capacity? No, that's not what it's for, okay? When you weld something, the idea is that's permanent. That's there. That's not going anywhere, right? So a tack weld is, is there to ensure that your dimensions are accurate, right? So you're welding a plate onto a column, right? So you get it, you know, the, you know the old adage, like measure twice, cut once, right? So it's kind of like measure twice, then tack weld, then measure again, right? Um, because once you deposit that full weld, you better be happy with it, because if not, you're gonna have to spend a lot of time and effort to, to grind that thing off. Um, so a tack weld is just a couple hits with your uh, stick weld or a couple, um, uh, uh, a couple hits of your, your MIG trigger just to hold it in place while more extensive final welds are, are placed. It's more of a fabrication concern, the idea that you'll place a tack weld, then deposit your full fillet weld, but I want you to understand the terminology. Now, fillet weld. Fillet weld is the most common type of weld used in structural engineering applications, period. That's the one we're gonna focus on for design. Uh, basically, you are placing a linear bead of weld that is joining part A and part B, two adjacent members. Um, if it's not a fillet weld, the second most common is what's called a groove weld. If you're in fabricator land or, or structural steel design land, you might hear of things like uh, PJP welds or CJP welds, complete joint penetration, partial joint penetration welds. The idea is that you cut a groove in your workpiece and you are filling the entire cavity with weld metal. You are trying to splice two elements together. There's not a terrible amount of work on the design side because you're basically filling it with so much weld that the capacity is governed by the base metal, not the weld metal. So it's not as big of a deal from a, uh, a fabrication standpoint. Now plug and slot welds, they aren't very common, but they're pretty much the, uh, the only other weld that you would see in a structural application. So the idea is you have a plate you lap another plate on top of it, and you have like a hole drilled on that upper plate. And so the idea is you fill that little hole with metal to try and uh, maybe transmit shear and lap joints or to prevent buckling, so on and so forth. Not very common, but that's pretty much it in terms of what you would see. So let's look at some of these in the real world. So these are about what a tack weld would look like. Again, you just place your part, hit a couple uh, uh, hits of your stick or a couple uh, squeezes of your MIG trigger, just to get the piece in place while you do your final measurements. And so if it's off by an eighth of an inch, well, you can grind that off pretty easily and reposition it, okay? It's only when you know that the piece is where it needs to be that you start depositing weld. This is a fillet weld. So this is a bead of weld that is uh, placed to transmit uh, uh, that horizontal shear from one piece to another. Um, you can see this is not bad in terms of weld placement. A little bit of spatter here and there, but, but not bad. This is arguably the most common weld that you see in structural engineering applications, period. I'd say 90% of the welds that we place in structural engineering are fillet welds. Easy. I think I might have 80 or 85% in my presentation, and that's probably low. That's probably low balling it. Now, groove welds, again, like I said, CJP or PJP welds, again, the idea is that, you know, you're sort of cutting a groove in one plate and actually filling it with weld metal. So you see this a lot in plate girder splices and things of that nature. Uh, and these are some examples of plug and slot welds. Not very common again, but I wanted to include it in case it ever came up in the field. In terms of the joints that you, uh, 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 that you deal with, so, you know, those are the types of welds, but what about the joints? The weld joints are more about how you're orienting the plates that are going to be welded. I would argue that the three most common that we deal with in structural engineering are 
T joints, lap joints, and corner joints, at least for fillet welds. Butt joints tend to be more common for groove welds. Um, edge, I'll be honest, we don't see a whole lot of in, in structural engineering land, but you can. But really, T, lap, and corner tend to comprise the vast amount of fillet welds that we see uh, in, in welded joint applications. Um, so far, so good? OK. OK. If you've ever done any type of welding in the real world, you know what I'm talking about here. Weld position, right? Is this type of welding easy? No. What's the easiest? This, right? So the orientation of the weld piece matters. And, and I'm sure that some of you are thinking, like, this isn't my problem. I'm an engineer. I don't care how the fabricator welds it. They can figure that out. Well, there, there's some truth to that. But I also think that you as an engineer should be aware of welding position from a design standpoint. In other words, if you are designing a component or a system where at the end of the day, the only way to deposit the last weld is to deposit it overhead, maybe rethink it a little bit. Maybe there's another way of depositing that or, or, or fabricating that component to where you don't have to deposit weld um, uh, uh, in an overhead fashion. So, you know, there's sort of four ways that you could deposit weld. There's flat, and, and I would argue that they get more difficult as you go down, right? So the easiest way to deposit a weld is flat, literally just going like this. Horizontal is sort of when the part's up like this and you're depositing it this way. Vertical is like that. And then overhead is like that. I've deposited my, myself, I've personally deposited some vertical fillet welds, and I thought they were pretty tough to get them you know, deposited well and get the the um, uh, uh, get the, um, the 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 proper weld geometry. I remember some of the welds that I deposited in the lab for my my PhD work. It was one of those. It's ugly, but it'll hold. You know, <laughs> at, at the end of the day, <laughs> just be honest with you. Uh, but I was. What's that? <laughs> no, not necessarily. I've seen some. Some some pretty ones by some some certified uh, uh, welders that are that are very impressive. Um, what's that? <laughs> oh goodness! Gotta pretend I didn't hear a lot of this. Okay. Any questions? Yes. If you're welding a cage, do you weld both sides? Yes. Yes, you would. Yes. That. Let, let me, well, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me, let me stop and, and answer that a little bit more effectively. Most times you are. Not always, but most times. Um, so we're going to learn here in a second about, about how to compute the capacity of a weld. And so the long story short is what we're going to do is determine the capacity per inch of weld. So 5.23 kips per inch. And so if you find out you only need six inches of weld and you can get that on one side, maybe just deposit it on one side and that's it. However, you know, let's start also talking about real world aspects. Let's say this is a bridge girder out in the field, right? And so if you don't weld that other side, are you worried about water getting in there? Maybe go ahead and just weld it, you know, even if you don't need the capacity. You know, maybe, maybe, that, maybe that's a, a concern. I don't know. More often than not, like, for example, in stiffeners, you're just welding around, you know. I mean, I mean that, that's pretty common, so. That's a good question. Any other questions? Just good stuff. Okay. All right. Let's talk now a little bit about weld symbols. Have any of you ever seen weld drawings before, fabrication drawings that they're pretty complicated, aren't they? I don't know about you, but like 5,000 years from now, um, archaeologists are going to find these, and they're going to have their own conspiracy theories about what they mean. You know, 
in all seriousness, when you start looking at intricate weld drawings, they get very complicated. Um, the way, the long story short, the way that we spec out welds on on drawings like AutoCAD templates and whatnot is we use a series of symbols and whatnot. So, for example, if we draw an arrow to a given joint and we place a flag over it, that flag indicates that that's a weld that's to be bless you, that that's a weld that's to be conducted in the field as opposed to being done in the shop. Um, we have a weld symbol back here, which will indicate the type of weld that we uh, place. Uh, triangle would indicate fillet, for example, which is the most common that we're going to do. Um, we have a way in which we place the symbols such that, you know, if we see the, the fillet symbol on both sides, I mean, we weld on both sides. If it's only on one side, we only place it on one. There's a lot of stuff that I could get into. The only thing that I really care about in terms of your ability is this, okay? This is all I care about. Um, when we do uh, homeworks and exams and whatnot, what I want to see is your weld callouts according to proper weld terminology, but only for these. So it's not a lot. Okay. So for example, I want to take a look at these two schematics, and these two schematics will tell you everything you need to know. Okay. We're only going to be covering fillet welds, and so I want to look over here at the image on the left. Okay. So the image on the left, there is uh, an arrow pointing to that joint, and there's three data points that's worth mentioning. There's the one-fourth, the triangle, and the six. Okay, so I'm looking at the one on the left. So the quarter refers to the weld size. Okay, and if you're wondering specifically what dimension I'm talking about, I'm talking about this dimension right here, however wide that is. Okay, so I'm talking about this dimension right here being, oh, being a quarter of an inch, okay? The six refers to the fact that it is six inches long. So in and out of the screen, that is a six inch long fillet weld, okay? Now, how do I know it's a fillet weld? Well, I know it's a, tri it's a fillet weld because of this triangle. But the other thing that's worth mentioning is where the triangle is located. So look at where this arrow is pointing. Because the triangle is on the bottom, that means it's on the side where the arrow is. So for example, if there was weld here, the triangle would be on top. Does that make sense? So over here, the arrow says the weld's right here. Whereas over here on the right, I've got the triangle on both sides. That means the weld is on both sides. And so this would be a weld that's a quarter inch fillet weld, and it's eight inches long on both sides. That's all I care about in terms of your ability to draw weld symbols. That's all I care about. Yes? So the triangle on the bottom, if the arrow is on the left side, does that, is it like a uh, absolute location? Like it's on the right, so, always on the right? Let me, let me put like, so let me, let me answer it this way. Oop. So if I wanted to spec out the same weld, I could say a quarter of an inch, six, and if I said like that, then what this would be saying is it's a weld on the other side, which would be over here. Does that make, does that answer make sense? Yes. That's, that's what it means. That's a good question. Everybody good? Okay. Now let's talk about the capacity of a fillet weld. How do we determine how strong a fillet weld is? Okay. Y'all remember trig? No. Well, I'm going to give you a crash course. Okay. We spec out welds by their weld size, which I'm going to call this letter A. But we spec out weld capacity by what's called the throat of the weld, the effective throat. The throat of the weld is defined as the distance from the root of the weld to the face of the weld. So if I assume that this is a 45, 45, 90 triangle, and I, let's take a look at this region right here. Like, let me highlight this out. And let's take a look at this region. 
let's say that that is a 45, 45, 90 triangle. And I have the hypotenuse, and I need to determine one of the sides. What I could do is I could use either the sine or the cosine. And I am dealing with the sine or the cosine of 45 degrees. What is the sine of 45 degrees? And what is that? Maybe 0 0.707? So whenever you see 0 0.707, is that a factor of safety? No, it's trig. OK. All right, so specking out a weld size, we can compute the throat of the weld, the effective throat, by taking the weld leg and multiplying it by 0 0.707, which is just the trig. It's just a sign of 45 degrees. Now. In order to determine the capacity of the weld, this is how we determine the capacity. So I want to read out the spec a little bit, and let's, let's look a little bit at the math. So the design strength, or the allowable strength, we're doing design strength, of welded joints shall be the lower of the base material strength and the weld metal strength. Okay. So let, let's just follow this out. So for the base metal, we're going to take some limiting stress times some area. And for the weld metal, we're going to take some limiting stress times some area. Okay, But if you notice, all this hullabaloo is being found in table J2.5. Okay, Now, J2.5 is on page 16.1-124. I want everybody up in their AIFC 15th edition steel construction manual to 16.1-124 because I want you all to see this. By the way, this is a really big table. In fact, I think you're on the other page. Okay. If you look at the table, what you'll see, it's like if you turn to 16.1-123, like the table takes up all of the previous page. It's huge. And if you look, you'll see these rows where it says like groove weld, it says partial joint penetration weld, complete joint penetration weld. The reason we're on 16.1-125 is we're looking at this. Fillet welds including fillets and holes and slots and skew T joints. So we're talking about fillet welds. OK, so if we're talking about fillet welds right here, what's the fee value? 0 0.75. What is the nominal strength of the weld? What's this right here? 0 0.6 times FEXX. What's going on with that 0 0.6? Why is that pop 0 0.6 popped up again? Because when we compute the capacity of a fillet weld, we assume that that electro or that weld metal is resisting the load through shear in the throat. Okay, and whenever something's subjected to shear, what do we find pop up in the spec again? That 0 0.6. Okay. Now, what is FEXX? FEXX is the electrode strength. When you buy weld electrodes from uh, uh, Home Depot or from Lowe's or from Airgas or wherever. You get, they come in a little box, right? And you look and it'll say something like E60 electrodes or E70 electrodes, right? Y'all know what I'm talking about? For those of you that have done welding before? Well, if it's an E70 electrode, what that means is that the electrode metal classification has an electrode strength of 70 KSI. So if it's E80, it's 80 KSI. If it's E60, it's 60 KSI. So all we do is we take that electrode strength, multiply it by 0 0.6, multiply it by 0 0.75. The only thing we have left is the area of the weld. What does the spec say? It says CJ2.2A. So we turn to J2.2A on page 16.1-119. And what it says is the effective area of a fillet weld shall be the effective length multiplied by the effective throat. So we take the length of the weld, multiply it by 0.707A. Here's phi, here's our stress, here's our area, boom. There's the capacity of a fillet weld. It's that simple. So it's a long formula, but it's plug and chug. What do you think? <laughs>
Let me stop for a second, see if anybody has any questions on this. The little A, the little, the a that's the, the size of the weld. So this right here, that's just, if I place the weld, that's the size of the weld. And that's something we can spec out. That's one of the reasons that um, welders make so much money is that they can deposit those types of welds, you know. And all that is is changing your speed, changing the, the, the settings on your weld machine, you know. I say all it is, but no, it, it, there's a lot of respect that needs to go to uh, welders that can place a quality weld. That is tough work, okay. Any questions? Okay. Now for the base metal, um, that so let me go back a little bit. Remember with bolts, how we were concerned with whether or not the bolt was going to play uh, fail or the plate was going to fail. Well, with welds, we have to ask ourselves if the weld's going to fail or the base metal's going to fail. And again, my apologies, but sometimes with engineering specifications, there's a tendency to hop around the documents. Like you got to go to this section, then turn to that section, then turn to this section, then turn to that section. That's just kind of the name of the game. Now, it says it's governed by J4. When you go to J4, there's a series of sections in J4. Um, for example, J, so J2 is concerned with welds. J3 is concerned with bolts. J4 is concerned with connected elements. So I'm curious, what is J4-3? Anybody seen anything associated with J4-3 before? Block shear, yeah. So we've seen, we've already been in this section of the spec before, right? So J41 is like connected elements subjected to tension. J42 is connected elements subjected to shear. That's what we're interested in. And so basically what we do for shear yielding is we take 0.6 Fy times the gross area in shear or 0.6 Fu times the net area in shear. So we look at either shear yielding or shear rupture. Uh, take the minimum of those two and that's our base metal capacity. So I know I've thrown a lot of equations at you, but I promise you that this is basically it in a nutshell. So whenever you're looking at weld metal capacity, it's point, it's your fee value times the electrode strength times the weld area. And for base metal capacity, we just take the minimum of these. I need a minimum in there. I need a uh, minimum of those two. So it's either shear yielding or shear fracture. But the overall point that I want to make is that a lot of these terms are stuff that we've seen before. We've already seen gross area and shear and net area and shear. And one final question I'll let you go. We're dealing with a welded connection. So what's the deal with AGV and ANV? They're equal. For fillet welds, they're the same. We're not removing material like we are with bolts where we're drilling or cutting through we're using a plasma a CNC to cut through the plate to remove material from the plate in order to uh, generate a connection. We just take the plate and weld it. So gross area and shear and net area and shear are the same. Yes? We're going to, you're talking about A? Yeah. So we're going to talk actually a little bit about that uh, during the next lecture because there are limits as to what A can be. Just like there are limits on bolt spacing, there are limits on weld size. So we're going to talk, like that's actually going to be a big focus of the next lecture is how do we spec out that weld size and what it means and what are our limits. I don't want to get into information overload, if you will, but I'll say that there are reasons for minimum sizes and maximum sizes like heat sink effects and plate distortion and whatnot. So there's a, there are reasons for that, and I kind of want to hold off on that. But we will get into it. I'm going to leave this slide up here for a little bit, but any questions? Wednesday, get ready to do some weld math. That's all I got, everybody. I will see you all. Let me stop the recording, and I'll pull this back up.